Welcome to Heritage Auctions. We are coming to you today from Heritage's um, headquarters in Dallas, Texas. I'm Christina Reese. I'm a marketing specialist here. And I'm here today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce who I'm here with today, and then I'll tell you why we're here. Um, we have Roberta Kramer, who is Heritage's Vice President of Strategy and Business Development. Um, we have Holly Sherritt, who is the Director of Modern and Contemporary Art on our West Coast uh, office. We have Alyssa Ford, Vice President of American and Western Art here. And we have uh, Aviva Lehman, who is the Senior Vice President of American Art. Now, the reason we're here is not to preview an auction, which is what we often do here with video at Heritage. We're going to talk about, instead, a specific topic. The reason it comes up is because our, um, our consignment director for Prints and Multiples, who's not on this video, was writing an article, and her name is Rebecca Van Norman. She was writing an article for our magazine. Heritage has a magazine called Intelligent Collector. She was writing it last month about an auction that was upcoming that featured a lot of Prints and Multiples by prominent women artists. Um, in her first paragraph, she had mentioned some things about the representation of women in art and how these trends have been shifting for better, maybe for worse, maybe not enough. Um, and we thought that this would be a, an interesting topic to kind of pull out and talk about a little bit. And so these women, this is a, a subject, a topic that's near and dear to all of us. We've all been in this industry one way or the other for quite a long time. So we have some experience around this. So I thought that we would dive in one of the first things I thought that I would bring up, however, to kick it off, are some, some auction numbers for 2022, which is the last year that we have sort of complete stats. Um, so last year was a record for late women artists at auction. Um, there was a 109% rise in the total value of their works. Um, and so from 2012 to 22, 2022, excuse me, um, we went from $228 million to $477 million. Of the 500 most expensive works that sold at auction last year, 50 of them were by women artists. Okay. Uh, of the top 100 works, just two were by women artists, Georgia O'Keeffe and Louise Bourgeois. And then of the top 50 most expensive works at auction last year, zero of them were by women artists. Okay, so we've got, we're trying to square these things that we're talking about here. Things are getting better. Still, of last year, of the most expensive artwork sold at auction, zero were by women artists. So let's talk about this asset class thing that happens as, you know, Art has become much more ubiquitous in people's homes and people's discourse and magazines and design and everything. And the auction houses, it shows. It's showing and what's happening in the auction houses. What do you, so let's talk about, as art has become more of an asset class, have women artists, living and dead, benefited from this market shift? What are you, what are you all seeing? And who wants to start? I'll go ahead and start. Okay, Holly. Um, I, first, I want to say, what a gift it is to work with such an extraordinary group of women. And I think just my colleagues here, just this group, um, we probably have close to even 100 years of auction experience <laughs> yes. between us because we've been in this industry for so long. Mm -hmm. And we've also worked at all of the major auction houses in the country. And we bring these clients to Heritage. And yet, if you look at our auction catalog, sadly, it's only a small fraction of the artists are by women. So what does that mean? If, if us, this kind of brain stress of the women working in the art world, can't have an auction with at least 50, you know, ideally more women, what does that mean? And to me, it's a systemic problem. So it starts with our art history books full of men. People want to collect big names, so they collect those men. Then they donate them to museums, and museums have shows of those men. Then when the museums promote the works, those men become more valuable. And once they're valuable, people want to sell them at auction. Mm -hmm. So when we put out a call to consign, what do we get? We get primarily male artists because they bring the most money. Yeah, yeah we, did, um, we did have a sale dedicated to women artists in the West, which was fun and exciting. What was intriguing was that I learned as a Western art specialist about artists I had never even heard of. And these women artists were better than some of the things that we get in that we're selling for ten, fifteen thousand um, dollars 
Um, so we, we did do a dedicated sale to Women Artists of the West. It did well as far as everything sold, um, but the numbers were still not matching what you know a James Bamet would sell for, even though uh, you know his student may have been in the sale. So we're we're still seeing a discrepancy in the um, the selling points, the the prices that are being brought at auction. But there is an interest, and there are collections. Um, people are collecting primarily women artists and that is the focus of their collection. So I think it's still a work in progress. Sure. Well, we've also seen some little bit of movement. It's not fast, let's, let's all be clear. But there are books like Ninth Street Women yeah. have, and, and there are others, that's just the big one that comes to mind. There, there is more recognition um, if you look at some individual, now granted most of these are dead <laughs> women, um, but I recently had a reason and I went and looked at Grace Hardigan. Mm. And even in the prints and multiples area, the prices are in fact on a very steep upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I would bet you more people in the collecting world know who she was now than, than before. They're also in the, um, what we would refer to as the primary market, the galleries, the art fairs that you see that you don't always see these artists at auction immediately. There are many, many more women, women of color, and they're getting a lot of attention in the gallery world and at the art fairs. So it's just, it's slow. Yeah. And I, I want to just add to that before, um, you know, sorry, Viva, before you jump in. That's right. I just think that um, you made a good point about the primary market. Um, the headlines are always about auction prices because auction prices are published and they're transparent. But actually, there's a lot of work bought and sold in galleries, at art fairs, privately, and we just don't have that data. Right. So it's my hope that if we looked at the market overall for women, that we would see that the gap is not so bad. Um, but we are focused all the time in the headlines on these records by men at auction, and it just doesn't cover the entire market. I'll add yes. <laughs> <laughs> a few things. I've, everything that my, my colleagues and friends have said, I agree with all of it. I will say that what I'm seeing in New York, I'm the only person on the panel here that's from New York. We really cover the whole country that's here. Right. <laughs> but I am based in New York, and what I've been noticing in what I've seen in terms of what shows are being put on, what the staff, the senior staff at all the big houses, mm -hmm. is women. So if you look at uh, most of our competitors, the largest auction houses in the world, you're seeing a lot of power at the high end that's now changing. There's a sea change in who's calling the shots. There's a lot more women involved in these conversations. Well, how is that changing things? It's moving it slowly. You know, what I think of it as this large barge, so to speak. The whole art world is almost this large barge. Mm. And we're all working, all of us on this panel, and you, Christina, and our, 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 our sisters in the art world are all moving the barge very slowly. And we're using a lot of force to make that happen. But it's not going to happen overnight. But what I'm seeing is, just in this year alone, at the Met, we had the amazing Alice Neal show. Oh my God, I mean, there was a line out the door. She was such a revolutionary artist who was doing figural abstraction when everyone else was going in another direction. Mm -hmm. She is the, one of the hottest artists in the world mm -hmm. right now. Right. Alice Neal, 15 years ago, her, it was pennies on the dollar of what she's selling for now. Or Joan Mitchell, her prices. Mm -hmm. David Zwerner represents her now. That's sure. a big statement to the marketplace. Right. Ruth Asawa. Her, her, her sculptures were, were selling for under $10,000 maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. That's all changing. Right. And now this amazing show that's about to open at the Met on Cecily Brown. Oh, my God. I mean, mm. this, is, this is what everyone's looking at. So there's definitely this energy and this synergy and this partnership going on between the art fairs. I mean, the Venice Biennale, the, everyone was just, the, the big story was the women artists. Yeah. So, yes. Who the, made up more than 50% of what was being shown in Venice. Exactly. And what all the data that you shared at the beginning of this talk is, is, is accurate. Obviously, we are still a very small figure, uh, percentage-wise, in what's going on in the art world. But we are probably 
when I say we, I mean the women artists, the women working in the arts, curators, art dealers, all of the above, interns, people in graduate school, mostly women. Okay. It's changing. It's slowly changing, and we're moving the needle slowly together. Yes. Yeah. So on that note, I'm thinking about the auction houses or our role in this whole movement of the barge, turning it around or turning it to another route, very slowly but surely. So in, in a little bit of, off of what Alyssa was just saying about scratching the surface, coming up with how, what is the auction's, basically, what is the auction's role? What is the auction house role? in greater awareness of women artists, dead or alive. It, there's a, you know, you're talking about what you're seeing in the primary market. Obviously, that's not even ha happening for us mm -hmm. until sometimes years down the line. Yeah. What's happening now actively, if you're scratching the surface and finding artists who you didn't even know about, you weren't taught about them in school, they're great, they're coming to yeah. auction, you want to promote this work, what is the auction house's role in this whole? trend. Yeah, well I'm going to jump in because you mentioned Ruth Asawa who happens to be one of my favorite mm. artists. Oh, she too. makes these wire sculptures. And who's been sculptures. making headlines like crazy over the last Abstract three years Abstract expressionist or so. work, just right. gorgeous pieces, beautiful shadows. And I will say that the way that we move this barge or um, slowly is, you know, if, an, if a consigner gives me a work by a woman artist, I'm going to take care of it and treat it like a gem. Um, for instance, Joan Mitchell is on the cover of our print catalog. It's not the most expensive piece in the sale, but we just love her work and we want to promote it. So we put it on the auction cover. The same thing happened with me with Ruth Asawa. When I started in this business about 20 years ago, I was drawn to her work and I had the opportunity to feature her work on the cover of the auction catalog. At the time, the work sold for about 100000 and it was a big deal. We drank champagne. The family was so excited. They congratulated me. Um, shortly after that, Christy started auctioning her work, took her to the next level. The prices went up. Then David Zwerner, one of the mega uh, superstar dealers, noticed, and he started selling her work. Now her work sells at auction for over a million dollars. Sure. So I don't take credit. There were a lot of other forces at play. Um, but sometimes just taking those small steps to give the artist a little bit extra to do more marketing, more promotion, more social media for the piece does, have a, does make a difference. Right, and we have catalog covers. We have opportunities for ads featuring works of art in publications like the New York Times. Um, we have a lot of venues. I do want to correct one thing which is the primary market, it, it's not true anymore that it takes a long time before we all see it on the auction house side. By and large, that's true. However, there are artists that are being bought at a gallery show. Many of them are women. They'll be bought at a gallery show for forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and six months later, that piece is at auction, and can, I've seen them bring more than a million dollars. There's mm -hmm. a supply and demand. There's um, a, a whole other layer, if you will, going on with some of these, and they're very young. They tend to be like women who are barely 30, or at least to me that sounds very young. <laughs> you know, there's a great um, documentary that covers this, this, The Price of Everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, they, there's a segment about just this. But we all see it. I mean, I know we, the, the four of us, and you, Christina, who are all at Heritage, we, as an American house, and tell me if, I, I don't mean to speak for all of us, but I know we're, we're close and we're friends and we talk about this a lot, that we have this, we feel this responsibility as a large auction house, you know, number three in the world, to take the time and almost slow down a little bit in what we're doing so that we can educate the marketplace about these artists. So we do a lot of writing about it in Intelligent Collector. We do these videos. We partner with different institutions to do lectures. Um, and we, we really understand that there's, we have to start with the younger collectors now, getting familiar with these women artists to almost get to a point where they don't look at women and men differently. They I was shouldn't going to be say, different. I was going to say, exactly. what is the difference in the they collecting shouldn't these be. days? I mean, look at Robert Motherwell and Helen Frankenthaler. Helen Frankenthaler is like my 
my, my, I revere her. I worship her. I, I wish I could meet her. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I dream about Helen Frankenthaler, not to be dramatic, but <laughs> I, I always, I wish I could go back and talk to her about what that was like when she was working alongside her husbands. Mm -hmm. And they were both enormously uh, rebellious and ev just disruptors to what was going on in the world. And everyone seemed to focus. They both had representation. I mean, if Helen was represented by Nodler, yet Robert Motherwell got all the attention and he got the prices decades before Frankenthaler. That's changing now. But I want to know what it was like for these artists. Like, you know, obviously Helen Frankenthaler is having such a moment right now and, 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 and Gagosian did a show of her work, not even in America, that's a big statement, a, an American woman being shown abroad. Mm -hmm. That says a lot mm -hmm. by Gagosian. But even more than that, there are other artists that have not come into their own yet. For instance, we talked about this earlier, Milton Avery, his wife Sally Michael is a, was a wonderful artist. His daughter March Avery is pretty good too. And they all have a very similar style that's very uh, evocative of, uh, you know, color field artists obviously. But Avery was the one, you know, Sally took us back seat to her husband to say, I'm going to support you mm -hmm. because you have a better chance at this than I do. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about the women artists, but it's about the women behind these male artists over these generations yeah. that never, we never got to hear their voices. Right. I think this is a very, very important and interesting conversation when it comes to women in the arts because dealing from a historical standpoint, um, there were women working, for example, Ernest Blumenschein and his wife. When Blumenschein came to Taos from New York, his wife was an incredible painter. And he looked at her and said, you can't paint anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, one of the founding members of the Taos Society of Artists, and we're men and we paint, and you will make jewelry. Okay, so she stopped painting and she made jewelry. She was a brilliant artist. Um, that said, one of the only members, well, the only female member of the Tau Society of Artists, Catherine Critcher, she had tremendous support from her father and her family as an artist, and she made it. She was the only woman in the 1915 founding of the Tau Society of Artists, which is incredible. Um, there's other artists such as Elmer Wachtel and Marion Wachtel, um, Marion's prices are much higher than Elmer's, and she's just a better, <laughs> oh, should I be saying she's a better artist? I personally think she's a better artist. That's true. Um, but, you know, we're talking about works from the 1920s, and then you have someone like my personal favorite, Maynard Dixon, who was so important as a Western artist of the 20th century. He did every mural, he did, he, he, you know, they said, oh, we have this idea for the Golden Gate Bridge. What's it going to look like? And he showed them. I mean, everyone went to Maynard Dixon for everything. Well, he was married to Dorothea Lange. Mm. And together, they jaunted out and they documented every aspect of the Depression together. Mm -hmm. Now, Dorothea Lange, of course, was tremendously successful. Um, after they divorced, he married another incredible artist who was famous for all of her murals. And so someone like Maynard Dixon, who was a man very secure in his own position as an artist, was able to back the women he was working with. Yeah. And I think that made a big difference. If the women had a support system behind them, they could attain that success. And that success has only been driven over decades and dec decades of auction records. If they didn't have the support, they painted botanical studies and did pretty things mm -hmm. and you know their prices are still low value which is incredible mm -hmm. the art world um, or the world of artists is it's not a it's not separate from society in general mm -hmm. and yeah. You could look at a lot of professions, you know, in 1915 especially, mm -hmm. how many women were doctors or lawyers or any number of other, even into, well into the 60s, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 you know, paint pictures of the children and mm -hmm. flowers, yeah. or of course the husband's career was the primary because that was true in society in general, right. so it didn't. It, it 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 isn't in a vacuum. 
is I guess what I'm trying to say. And we're still catching up. We're absolutely Correct. still catching up. And one of the things that you guys are, I think, touching on is this sense of almost a custodianship of older work that was overlooked once upon a time. It's like, well, somebody needs to be responsible or accountable to this this work that's actually very good. You're seeing work and you're really responding to it. Yeah. And you're saying, I don't think that enough people have seen this yet. What can we do to shepherd this into exactly. you know, a market existence? But, uh, but when, when we talk about that, when we, I kind of want to get back to something that you just said in a minute, but what's leading this? I mean, is it just culture? It's just saying, let's continue in this inclusivity trend? Is it is it collectors saying we want more women artists work? Is it is it institutions that are asking for? As we've seen, like the Tate, all these all of these major institutions are doing so many more shows by women artists, so many solo exhibitions by women artists and group shows. But wh who, how much are the clients part of this? How much are oh they driving gosh, this? I have to jump in on this and say the clients are a huge part of this, yeah. especially in small markets like Western art, which is a very tight knit collector base mm -hmm. and it almost feels like everyone knows each other we go to you know hundreds of events together and everyone's talking you know they want to talk about art they want to mm -hmm. talk about their collections and they've been collecting a long time western art collectors are so passionate they have everything from a remington frederick remington up to a john quick to see smith which is one of the leading women Native American artists in Western art right now, we're seeing, you know, they put things on the market at three to 5,000, eight to 12,000 for a particularly large piece, and they're selling for a quarter of a million dollars. And so what's happening is these conversations are happening within the collector group um, and within the expert group. We, we all talk about this and build that excitement and say, yeah, you know, let's broaden the range of our collection so that it's not just Frederick Remington depicting, you know, the cowboys and Indians in the Old West, but it's that all the way up to cur our current political climate, right. which is a really beautiful statement as a collector, because especially, and I'm, I am speaking from Western art perspective, you know, there's a lot of history there with um, Native Americans and um, there's a lot of political statements that may not ring as true today that are, or things we don't necessarily want to uh, acknowledge true. or accept but by broadening these collections they're telling a story of Western art and to have a Charlie Russell or a Remington next to a John Quick to see Smith which is abstract and powerful and political and a really strong woman is just, um, it's extraordinary to see a collection like that. So it is, it, I think the collectors tell the story of the history and where we've been and where we're going. Where we're going. Yeah. May I add something to that? Please. I agree with everything Alyssa just said. I will add that the bigger problem we're having on the secondary market in general at all the houses is that it's harder to find quality material especially by artists of a bygone era that are no longer on this planet. So there's such you know, a finite amount of There is such yeah. a finite yeah. amount. I mean, I've sure. been working in auction now for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I, I think everyone here has been for decades. Mm -hmm. So when I first started in the auction industry in 1998, which by the way, I worked at a much larger auction, a, a, a huge auction house that it was the first year women could wear pants, believe mm -hmm. it or not, oh 1998, goodness. not that long ago. It was wow. the first year we could wear pants. Um, and... <laughs> It's true, and uh, even then, the catalogs were full of masterworks, lots of them. You found them at every house. Has some flag pictures, my God, Cassatt's, Mars and Hartley, you know, officer series pictures, lots of it. It's gone, it's all in institutions, mm -hmm. it's all being donated, it's harder to find quality materials. So we have to broaden the net of what is considered really important art. Well, yeah, yeah and that's like, so we think of men, the kind of the universal genius of men. If men paint, then what they're depicting is universal. Whereas if women paint, what they're depicting is domestic or sure. feminine or female. But, yeah. we'll, we'll, but by expanding our definition of what art is or what can be, we keep, we were able to find more things that qualify for that. 
and right. make sense to people, the vernacular, everything. So everyone's getting educated at the same time is what it feels like to yeah, me. And I think, and, oh, sorry. I just wanted to add on too. I mean, when you're talking about broadening art, we need to broaden what we can bring to auction. So in contemporary art, there are so many women artists. I just went to a Pipilotti wrist show making big scale video art, installation, performance based art. Mm -hmm. Those pieces are difficult to sell at auction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the market tends to favor the war halls, things that can be easily shipped, traded, that we're familiar with. You know, it's very complicated for us to discuss and present a video work or an installation or conceptual piece. So we're leaving out a whole segment of the market. So with far we calendars. are. So far so we far. are. So far. But now that we have our, people are buying works online and we can present videos, I mean, this is going to change. And like you mentioned, we're slowly getting there. Yeah, yeah. but it does sort of feel like George O'Keefe is our patron saint, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> because mm. she is one of the most expensive 20th century artists period. I mean, mm -hmm. Jimson yes. Weed sold for $44 million. Right. And so much of O'Keefe's mindset in her art is the, f the feminine side of her psyche and her heart. So even going back, Roberta mentioned 1915, this sort of water period modernism was flourishing in America. And O'Keeffe was part of her husband, Alfred Stieglitz's cir mm. circle, Gallery 291. But the material she was churning out then, 1916, was a series actually based on her miscarrying a child mm. and the devastation around it. And a lot of that had to do with the drama she was enduring with Stieglitz, and that's a whole other story, which we could <laughs> yeah, talk about sure. another time. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is definitely an awakening from the entire buying world, collecting world, to have an interest in these overtly and thoroughly feminine subjects. Mm -hmm. It's part of humanity and so it, it's got to change and so any major collection if you don't have important masterworks by women artists you are lacking in an entire aspect of american art history and in american the whole, history the whole human narrative is yeah. just not in there yeah. as we move through the years and through the decades and as the infrastructure the structures supporting women artists get better all the time and as more women get into the art world jobs that, like the ones that we have and at the institutions the museums the galleries what have you do you think we're still going to be having this conversation 10 years from now? Oh, God, I hope not. I, you know, I have to say, having this conversation is difficult because I don't want to have this conversation. To me, art, you know, we look at art because it's beautiful and it's meaningful and it's historical. And we should be looking at art because of that, not because a woman painted it or, you know, a man painted it or whoever painted it. I want to see art for what it is and not for necessarily who painted it. And so one, one example that hits very close to me um, is the most expensive painting that I've ever found in my career. We sold it for $1.8 million. It was by a woman artist named Euphemia Charlton Fortune. And it was painted in the 20s. No, actually, that was painted 19, I think, 18. Um, and it was, you know, it was a very beautiful landscape. We, we had 300, 500,000 on it. We sold it for 1.8 million. Um, but what was exciting about her is that she was written up in all the papers that she painted like a man. <laughs> That's right. what they said. She didn't get married. She didn't have kids. In fact, there were, uh, rumors that, you know, maybe she had, other female lovers, but you know that wasn't discussed, and that wasn't a that wasn't a thing then. Um, but what's fascinating is the the art critic write up. She painted like a man, mm. which was what their way of saying this is the real deal. This is good. Mm -hmm. This is really good. And what's interesting about her is that while people who were recognizable female artists like Georgia O'Keeffe. Mary Cassatt, mm -hmm. you know, Mary Cassatt painted the women with mm -hmm. the babies, mm -hmm. or even what men painted at the time, the ladies in the gardens with parasols and frilly dresses. She didn't paint that. Mm -hmm. She painted women out in the fields, on the fishing docks, like real women out working. Um, her brushstroke was aggressive and vibrant. Mm -hmm. And in looking at her art, you wouldn't say, oh, a man painted this or a woman painted this. You look at a Cassatt, you say, yeah, a woman probably painted this, right? 
I want to get to that point in art where we look at something and we say, it's not a, a gender role. It's something that's deserving of being a multi-million dollar painting. It's beautiful, it's exquisite, it's telling a story. And so that's, that's my hopes is that we don't have to have this discussion. Although I think, I was going to say, as <laughs> much as I would, <laughs> the idea. that sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we will be having this conversation. But why? Now, but why will we? Why? We also haven't brought up. All, mm -hmm. We all work for a, a, a big auction house. There, as Aviva mentioned earlier, lots more women in senior roles, etc. But what do we know about? Are they being paid? What the men right. are being paid? There's a whole. Yeah other layer, if you will, um, about women and we keep, I mean, it seems like we, we take steps forward and then we take some steps back, yeah. doesn't it? And that's yeah. a light, I mean, really. Yeah. That's true. That's not, again, it's not just about art, art world, auction world, right? This is just about sure. the world. Yeah. And you've got to take out your emotion and act like a man in life, I, my, I, I have daughters, mm -hmm. we, we see, I, I teach women, and um, this is a question I know when my, my, my students talk to me about interviews, and they say, you know, something that sort of breaks my heart a lot, or they're like, you know, do I need, give me advice on how to not act too like me in my mm. interview. That's mm. truly, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Mm, yeah. It breaks my heart. And I want people to lead with exactly who they are and not have to pretend they're anything else. You know, we, I, just another example that came to my mind is this artist that I really like. Her name is Irene Rice Pereira, who is a pretty obscure artist, but important. She was part of the Park Avenue Cubists. She worked with Charles Green Shaw, um, part of that whole scene, and George L.K. Morris. And she signed her works, I period Rice mm. Pereira, so people would not know that she was a woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, lot a lot of writers of did, did the same yeah. thing, right? Exactly. exactly. I, and I would guarantee you there are still Absolutely. But isn't well, it but shocking? actually, these yeah. days now, it seems like if you know, if a woman is making some artwork, it's it behooves her to have her name on the work. I mean, because now people are looking yes. for this; they're hungry but for this. But this is so very recent. It's very recent, and that I don't know if ten years <laughs> mm -hmm. we'll be enough is time. No. enough time Absolutely. where we don't need to have these conversations. No, it's not enough time. But we're having these conversations so that our children hopefully don't have to. Don't have to have these conversations. Yeah. But it is interesting, like Aviva said, you know, it is for the longest time the art world was a male dominated industry. Yeah. And what was wild to me when I was going through college is that I think there was maybe two guys in all of my art history classes. That's right, yeah. that's right. And when you enter the industry, all of a sudden, the women are gone. There's <laughs> like, where like where, come from? how did these guys get here? Where where are they from? You they know? were the two guys napping when they turned the slides <laughs> on. Yes. But and so, at the very top, though, if you look at contemporary art world, I, let's not forget that we have these superstar male dealers like yes. Gagosian yeah. driving the market. And when women are still dependent on the men to open doors for them, yes, it could be very helpful or it can be very hurtful. And there are men like David Zwerner and others um, promoting women like, with, like um, uh, oh my gosh, Kasama yeah, is a good Kusama example. And Kusama Mitchell, all of them. and bringing the market up. But, you know, then again, you have a young artist who sells for over a million dollars at auction like, like she did recently. And then the media goes crazy talking mm. about her relationships with her older dealer. I mean, there's so yeah. much, it's a media circus. Yes. So women are still being, not their art is not being looked at, they yeah. are being looked at. Their personal lives are being scrutinized. And yeah. this goes all the way back to Helen Frankenthaler and L Elaine de Kooning talking oh, about their yes, affairs right. and their relationships. And maybe that's yeah. how and why they're successful. So we need to get past that point where the, we're waiting for the men to open the doors. Where and it was I fine think, that you know, Picasso had a million <laughs> sure. Mistresses and a payroll yeah. I guess, of you children know, and grandchildren. Well, we, we know all that about him. We know about his affairs. We just don't judge him for it. Right. right. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly. right. Exactly. So, I mean, the biographies of artists have, start, have started to play a huge role in how we think and feel about artists and the artwork itself. That's true for every artist yeah. out there. We want to know, what, does, what are they like? What are their politics? What are, how do they live their life? What is their character? That seems to be something that's happened it, a lot over the last 10 years. But also um, those gender roles, I think, 
are you know so generational and Holly and I were having this conversation in that in the art industry we're dealing with various generations who are collectors yeah and the very let's say the youngest group of collectors mm -hmm. you know they don't have the type of wealth obviously that the older generation has so we are dealing with an older generation and what does that mean that that generation grew up with different gender roles and different ideals. Um, and so in some ways you have to, or at least I try to respect the fact that we're not all coming from the same place. Yeah. You know, my generation is, is going to be very different than, you know, Holly's daughter's generation, yeah. um, who, you know, will look at me and maybe say, oh God, I can't believe she just said that, or mm -hmm. I can't believe she still does that. You yeah. know, yeah. there are generational gaps and I think we have to be sensitive to those as much as we can while still, you know, defending what we believe in yeah. as women. Are in the our younger generation. collectors, this, this younger, the youngest cohort of collectors who are buying from auction, are they more interested in late artists who are women or the here I think and now? That's both? probably a good question for Holly because yeah. most of my collectors are right. a little more um, sophisticated and have been doing this a long time time so I don't I mean it, it's interesting there's not one market there are many markets so Alyssa is dealing with you know a different collecting base than I am in the contemporary art mm -hmm. but I will say that our buyers and our bidders have a lot of power to change things and we haven't really touched on that point so in terms of if if you really want to elevate the market for women it's the bidders who have the opportunity to do that and that's why Absolutely. we take steps to make sure that we can reach as many people as possible but i don't think people necessarily understand that you know when we get a work of art we're not putting a price tag on that piece we are giving you an estimate which is a range of what the work has sold for in the past right so we're looking at past comps these comps can change quickly. Mm -hmm. If there is a, a buyer base for women artists and people really want to bid and we can get you know one or two people to bid on a work, that market changes for that artist oh, going right. forward. Right. right. Yeah. So the next time, you know, we can feel better about putting a higher estimate. It doesn't take a long time necessarily. This is why, no. you know, maybe in 10 years, things will be different. Th this is a small group of people in the art world that have the power to change things. It's a very small fishbowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we're, we, we act as advisors, yes. right? Right. The bidders, bidder collectors, have the power um, in their bidding to move a market up and we act with them in terms of education. Not every collector has uh, the confidence of sure. buying things just on their own eye, especially yeah. Yeah. a younger collector is mm -hmm. often looking for some guidance sure, and, and education, and that's something that the auction house can provide, the same way the galleries certainly do, right. but we can't tell people what to buy. Right. We can mm -hmm. strongly suggest this is a great work, <laughs> right. it would be great in your collection, tell them all about it, but there are gallerists who can actually oh, sure. say, you're buying that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that we can't do. <laughs> right, so that's true. But I would say to buy works by women artists, given that there is this gap and things are changing, if you buy now, you know, right. good investment in the future. There are few and far between these works. I have a work right now by Louise Bourgeois coming mm -hmm. up in our print sale. Uh, you mentioned her earlier. Her spider was one of the top mm -hmm. auction records ever. Mm -hmm. I have a print. She made a drawing out of rope made it into a 3D model, printed it on handmade paper. There were only 50 of these prints made, and the estimate is four to $6,000. Wow. Oh, wow. Why aren't more people bidding? So here I am making a plea. <laughs> I want it. Wow. Bid on that, you know? Yeah. And you want it. And the, the want issue it. is the women sometimes, you know, maybe not the case of the people out here, but some of the women working in the art world who appreciate this most, don't have the wages to collect the art. Yes. So uh, if we can raise the bar, like like Roberta said earlier, this is a societal issue. It's not just about the art world. 
if a woman has a working wage, we're going to see collecting, people collecting different, differently. Um, more women collectors might tend to gravitate towards more women artists. I don't know. If the wage gap across every industry changed, yeah, we'd have right. women in a better position to be collectors because right. most of, I mean, it's usually a big story when a woman is, makes a big purchase. I remember yes. a few years ago, remember when the Banksy sold at yeah. Sotheby's, yeah. the one that shredded, it was a woman who bought it. And that was a story. And I remember feeling <laughs> angry. I'm like, who cares? Why is that a big deal that a woman bought it? Uh -huh. But it was because it was so unusual. Right. That yeah. says a lot. There's a lot of issues with That's that. That's news. If yeah, it's news, it's news. Yep. Well, and it, and what we, we do have now that we didn't historically. Last summer, I was in a used bookstore in Cape Cod, and I found <laughs> an old book called Women Collectors. <laughs> and I bought it. I plunked down the six ninety nine or whatever, for, and as as I went through the women collectors that were depicted in this book, that was probably you know printed in the fifties or something, <laughs> what all either inherited vast wealth from their fathers, sure. or were married, as as my mother would say, married well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And but that their husbands indulged their hobby, if you will, of collecting. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a change now because we do have women who are founders of big companies all on their own, thank you very much, mm -hmm. who are collecting all on their own. Yes. And yes. It, but agreed, not enough of them. But it still shouldn't be a story yeah, that exactly. a woman <laughs> bought something it, you know, would it be a story if a woman went out and bought a big diamond? Can you imagine? Uh, Can you no. imagine if, like, oh, this Basquiat triptych was bought by a man? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's what we were talking about earlier, right, is that we hope that one day we aren't having this discussion. That's right. And yeah. that it isn't a big deal, that's that right. there are, you know, collectors from different genders, different races, different whatever. It just needs to be at equal, just yeah. equal. It doesn't have to be better, worse, just it should, it's a non-issue. It should be a non-issue. Right. And sometimes the art does speak for itself. I will sure. say we had, um, we had a painting come in a couple years ago that it, it was by a woman named Blanche Grant. No one ever heard of this woman. In fact, I didn't hear of this woman. I had no idea who she was at the time. I look up her records and I think the highest price paid at auction was, you know, $750 or something. And I thought, that's weird. This painting is really good. Mm. I mean, it was good. Mm. It was, I want to say 1912 Taos, big, rich, beautiful piece. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to bring it in. I hope no one kills me here that I'm bringing this in because I'll buy it. You know, I love yeah, this painting. Yeah. I think it's great. So we brought it in at, I think, uh, three to $5,000. And the consigner was wonderful. He was like, well, let's give it a shot and see yeah. what happens. And that day I stood on the podium and I sold that painting for $65,000. Wow. And it was extraordinary. It was one of those moments. What a great story. Yeah, yeah. it was a moment that as an auctioneer, mm. as an art appraiser and as an art lover and as a woman, I'm thinking here, here this painting is that is done by an early female artist in Taos, and nobody knows anything about her, but the painting was so exquisite mm -hmm. that nobody cared. Nobody cared who she was. Yeah. This wasn't a name collector. This wasn't, oh, it's a Warhol, or oh, it's a, a Ufer, or a Dixon. This was, we don't know who she is. The story was, here's a great, great painting. painting. That's here's right. a great painting. Yeah. And that's, again, you know, I, I emphasize this point. That's what I want to get to is, this is a great painting. There is nothing else behind it that, you know, yeah. there's no politics or anything driving the, the numbers on this. Um, you know, it's not Gucci. It's not Prada. It's just fabulous. It's yeah. just good. And that's what that was. And, and uh, needless to say, the consigner was very excited. <laughs> and we still hold the record till this day for that, for that painting. Um, and you know, I'll never forget that moment. Well, and exciting. that's what the market should be doing, right? Right. Exactly. Is the market recognized that it was a fabulous painting? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not a trophy. Yeah. Um, sure. And 
It didn't scream who the artist was from across the room, exactly. yeah. which has tended to be an unfortunate trend yeah. over recent years. Yes. So, but it was a great painting. Yeah, the yeah. market saw it and bid appropriately on it. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't always happen. No, I just want to say, I, <laughs> I mean, that would be wonderful if we could just yeah. take in every painting that we personally enjoyed <laughs> and loved and thought was amazing, especially in the contemporary art. I've learned in this job, I have to suspend my own aesthetic judgment. Mm. That's number one. I would love to be promoting. Well, we compartmentalize, don't we? Yeah, yeah totally. right? Suspend, I mean, no I there's sometimes there are works that I really would love to feature, but I know I could have a negative effect on the market for the women or sure. whoever. Um, and that's important to note that if you do put a new artist on the auction block, you have to be careful. You have to know that there are people tracking, bidding, wanting that piece, and you have to feel confident enough um, that you can put it on the market and do it a favor and not a disservice. You don't want to bring pieces to auction that don't sell. Right. Yeah. That's, now, now there's a public record and you've actually hurt that artist's career. So we're always being very careful what we take and what we don't sure. take. And you know, there's yeah. a responsibility there. So it's not like, okay, this woman is great. We're not promoting the artists. That's for the dealers, the galleries. Right. And generally we get artists later, a little bit later after they've already developed an audience. So for Alyssa's painting, I think it was just, it was beautiful and she knew her market. Well, and, and it was old, it was right. historical. So there is right. that difference because yeah. there are, more artists, you know, living artists. There's lots of them out there. And a lot of times they come to us and say, hey, can you represent our work? And Holly's yeah. right. I would never do that right. with a contemporary artist that came to me because it's like, we don't want to damage um, their market in any right. way. Which really yeah. speaks to kind of the responsibility of a good auction house. Yeah, and yeah. some of us remember sure. that's a period, that was before right. the internet, yeah. you were able to take chances yeah, in sure. a way that you can't exactly now right. because that failure to sell or very mm -hmm. disappointing Result. price it, it's out there it's available and it's out there forever yeah, yeah. um so the internet has of course the way it's changed mm -hmm. everything in the world it's certainly changed our ability to try sure. something right. without harm. So we have to really weigh yeah. that we really think either we're gonna buy it yeah. <laughs> or we know we know we can convince enough people. And of course, enough because people. this is an auction right. that we all work in, not a gallery. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to convince at least two people, right. preferably a bunch more. Right. But one person isn't gonna isn't going to fly. Right. But I think taking those leaps of faith from a historical standpoint is much easier. Yes. Because yeah. there are, women are liberated now. You want to paint, paint. You can paint whatever you want. Right. You know, making it as an artist is much more difficult. It's like being a Hollywood celebrity. Right. But, yeah. but you, you can do it. You are allowed to do it. Historically speaking, women, they weren't allowed to do it. And if they did, yeah. they were breaking like all the rules. They were rebellious. And so being able to kind of take that leap of faith for a historical painting and say, oh my gosh, this is really great. She shouldn't have been painting this in 1912, but she did. Yeah. And it's just as good as what any of the guys were painting in Taos. Let's do this because the clients get that. They say, oh my gosh, this is a very early work by a woman artist who probably shouldn't have been doing this. I want this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's cool. It gives it this extra edge to the um, story itself. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't necessarily damage her market because her market was already essentially non-existent. Yeah. yeah. Well, so let's start to wrap this up, but I wanna just, whoever wants to speak to this, answer it, or any or all of you, what would you, what do you think could or should happen to continue to allow this to improve? The, situation for women artists to improve at auction and generally speaking? I think that it really boils down, it's a challenge and it's an uphill battle and it will take a long time. But the two factors that are critical are the passion. We have to continue to stay passionate about what we do and fight for mm -hmm. it and education. Passion and education are the two platforms that we need to just use endlessly on auto repeat. 
and go across the country and lecture and speak and connect and network and, and that and continue moving the barge slowly. Right. Oh, I, w I was just going to say, just having panels like this, to be aware yeah. that these gaps do exist and acknowledging them and then always thinking when you do get that work of art, you know, reminding yourself, well, maybe we should be thinking in terms of gender here. Give that, give that piece a little bit of extra lift and really showcase it and slow down a little bit. And I think that helps. I think it. supporting women in general, supporting just our colleagues sitting here together, supporting each other in our growth of careers, and you know, art, you know, young artists out there that are painting know that they can do it. Um, I think women need to help lift each other up and definitely not put each other down. Just be there for each other. <laughs> 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 All right, well, on that note, thank you, Aviva and Alyssa and Holly and Roberta. Thank you for being here uh, today and thank having you. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.